This investigation is sponsored by Wonder. Hey fellow seekers, I'm Mr. Mythos. In the early 1990s, two esteemed scientists, Dr. Vlail Kuznachev and Dr. Alexander Trofimov, constructed a strange metal chamber in the laboratory at the Experimental Siberian Branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Their aim was to conduct the ultimate test of extrasensory perception the ability for the human mind to receive information invisible to normal physical senses. But little did they know that this chamber would lead them into some of the most bizarre and disturbing events ever recorded at the North Pole. And that's where they were headed after they finished. The chamber they built was a thin sheet of polished aluminum rolled into a cylindrical spiral, what they called a Kozarev mirror. They named it after the eccentric but brilliant Soviet astrophysicist Nikolai Alexandrovich Kozarev, who, after 10 years of forced isolation, was led to the greatest discovery of his life. This was Kozarev's theory of time, and a theoretical time device which he failed to complete before his sudden death in 1983. But before we dive in, I've got a technology here that might not be able to travel through time and space, but to me it feels pretty futuristic at least in 2023. As you might know, I'm a bit obsessed with using AI-generated art in my videos because I cover some of the most obscure topics with hardly any visuals in existence, and AI art helps me bring these stories to life. Today's sponsor, Wonder, is one of my go-to apps because this art generation is so impressive. Sometimes I can't tell it wasn't made by a human. And on top of that, it's really easy to use. It's as simple as picking an adjective, like radioactive, then a subject, time machine, then describe the situation, like arriving in 15th century Paris, and finally choose a style. I'll pick magic, then hit create, and you can get way more detailed with your prompt, but sometimes I just keep it simple. Either way, it only takes a few seconds to bring your words to life. And Wonder is offering my viewers a free trial of Wonder Premium, where you get access to over 20 styles and unlimited, faster art generation with absolutely zero ads. So if you're ready to experience the joy and thrill of bringing your ideas to life, use my link to download Wonder right now and you'll get a free premium trial to put your creativity to the test. Thanks again to Wonder. It's time to travel to the past and crack open the mystery of the Kozarev Time Mirror. In order to understand the Kozarev mirror and the strange events surrounding it, we first need to understand the rather unique circumstances that led to its invention. In the dark days of the 1930s, when famine had decimated the Soviet Union, a young Nikolai Kozarev worked in the hollowed halls of the Polkova Astronomical Observatory, where he'd soon become hailed as one of the most promising astrophysicists in the country, and a beacon of hope for his struggling nation. However, there was a sinister shadow lurking, and this was the paranoid, ever-watching eye of Joseph Stalin's regime. In November of 1936, a single bitter accusation of counter-revolutionary activity was hurled by a disgruntled graduate student, sealing the fate of the entire observatory's staff. Overnight, almost all of Kozarev's colleagues were executed. For his scientific contributions, Kozarev was spared. However, he was arrested, and the Stalin regime condemned him to 20 years in a solitary gulag cell. For most people, especially a rising scientist like Nikolai Kozarev, this kind of isolation would have destroyed all purpose and motivation. He was banished to a world severed from any new scientific developments, and science waits for no one. 20 years is a very long time to be gone. Alone in his cold, windowless cell, Kozarev was left to wander only in the abyss of his own memories and thoughts. But he never gave up. He may have been robbed of his career, but he never stopped his scientific work, though he now worked only in purely theoretical physics. After years of thought experiments, completely separated from any new developments, trends, and dogmas embraced by his free peers in the academic world, as you can imagine, Kozarev's scientific understanding split sharply away from the mainstream narrative on the day of his arrest in 1936. With all the time in the world and no new influences, his prison-forged physics evolved into something incredibly unique. But little did Kozarev know that, for years, a group of his old colleagues on the outside had been lobbying the Stalin regime to free him. 
So to his complete surprise, in December of 1946, he was awarded an early release. The entire Soviet scientific community celebrated Nikolai Kozarov's return. After more than 10 years, their beacon of hope was back to catapult Mother Russia to new heights of achievement. What they didn't expect, though, was that the scientist who entered the Gulag was not the same who came out. He'd long disconnected from mainstream science. Kozarov was completely unaware of the discovery of nuclear energy, for example. And the controversy surrounding him skyrocketed after Kozarov published a paper on his theory of time. Developed entirely in a solitary cell, the theory was based on Kozarov's photographic memory of the works of Albert Einstein and German Minkowski, who argued that gravity is not a force, but rather a distortion of the four-dimensional space-time continuum. Depending on what the matter is made of and how it's shaped, it will distort and warp space-time in different ways. And based on these ideas, Nikolai Kozarev proposed that something could be created to intentionally affect time. In a single statement, Kozarev shocked the entire Soviet Union. Quote, A mirror can be made that can bend absolutely anything, including time. Time travel is possible through a mirror. End quote. He wasn't being metaphorical. Nikolai Kozarev really was serious about using a mirror. And stick with me here as I try my best to explain. To begin, the astrophysicist proposed that light and time aren't so different from one another. Just as light is a type of energy, Kozarev came to the conclusion that time is a type of energy too. And similarly, with light we can only perceive a fraction of a much larger spectrum. For example, infrared and ultraviolet light are invisible to the naked human eye. And according to Kozarev, time energy works similarly. The full spectrum of time, the past, present, and future, all exist simultaneously. However, under normal conditions, we can only perceive the present time. And back to the mirrors, a mirror doesn't technically reflect light. It actually bends light and changes its direction due to the material the mirror is made out of and its design. So accordingly, with the right setup, it may be possible to bend and direct time, too. Kozarev's wild theory led him to be disgraced by some of the Soviet Union's leading physicists, and sparked a decades-long debate over whether his theory should even be tested. Without any funding, Kozarev used the little savings he had to continue developing his theory and experimenting with different metals. Finally, he settled on a mixture of several special grades of aluminum, Melting them into a thin sheet, he proposed that the key would be to forge the sheet into a concave mirror. Today, concave mirrors are used in modern technology such as astronomical telescopes, electron microscopes, and solar-powered heaters to gather in and focus a significant concentration of light. And this property of concave mirrors has been known since ancient times, such as in 212 BC when the mathematician Archimedes designed a giant round mirror to concentrate the sun's rays and incinerate entire fleets of wooden Roman ships. And this was exactly what Nikolai Kozarev had in mind. Even more jarring than the concept of time bending, Kozarev wanted to build a time concentrator. In the last years of his life, he proposed a simple but deliberate device to take full advantage of the properties of concave mirrors. A long sheet of his aluminum concave mirror could be rolled into a perfect cylindrical spiral, then placed upright, leaving room inside for a person to sit. Finally, the device would be rotated one and a half turns clockwise. Time energy would be captured by the opening and become more and more concentrated the further it flows into the spiral. So theoretically, the person sitting in the pool of concentrated time energy would suddenly exist in multiple points in the space-time continuum. Simply put, they'd gain access to the past and the future at the exact same time. Unfortunately, Nikolai Kozarev was never able to build his time concentrator, nor further his research. In 1983, his health abruptly declined in a matter of weeks, and on the 27th of February, he died, the cause unknown. After Kozarev's death, his theories on time bending and concentration were brought back into the public spotlight. They were still highly controversial, but now with a greater air of intrigue. 
by almost all measures, Kosarev was a scientific genius. So what if he was on to something? Just a handful of years after Kozarev died, the Soviet Union began to collapse and a deep societal change was on the horizon. President Mikhail Gorbachev had enacted several major policies of openness, which allowed for far more freedom of speech and democracy. As a side effect, this also opened up the possibility for serious scientists to test the strange experiment proposed by Nikolai Kozarev. In fact, the government-operated Russian Academy of Sciences was ready to fund it. And this brings us back to the scientists who received that funding and built the world's first Kozarev Mir, Dr. Vlail Kuznichev and Dr. Alexander Trofimov. And based on their results, the Mir actually worked. But what they saw in the Mir wasn't pretty. In December of 1990, Kuznichev and Trofimov transported their Kozarev Mir to a small remote village known as Dixon, one of the closest permanent settlements to the North Pole. This location was chosen intentionally, as Trofimov explained, quote, The permafrost zone surrounding Dixon stores information for many tens and hundreds of thousands of years. According to Nikolai Kozarev, any process for example, the transformation of water into ice is accompanied by the absorption of time energy, and the ice stores this energy of time. When the ice begins to melt, the reverse process of energy release of time begins." End quote. In other words, because Dixon's permafrost was slowly melting, they believed that it was literally emitting ancient information in the form of time energy captured there hundreds, thousands, and even millions of years ago. And this was important as the Kozarev Mir needed to collect and concentrate as much time energy as possible. The experiment at Dixon was the first of its kind. No one knew what to expect. But they certainly didn't foresee the madness heading their way. These experiments became so infamous that multiple Russian books and films have been made about them, including a feature-length documentary titled Mirrors, Breaking the Future, produced by the official Russian state TV channel Russia One. But for accuracy's sake, I'll be cross-referencing with Kuznichev's and Trofimov's 1992 book titled Cosmic Consciousness of Humanity which contains the original laboratory records, experiment journals, and witness audio tapes transcribed in English. So you know, the story I'm about to tell you, even if it sounds quite alien and disturbing, are documented events. And we'll begin with the fear. For the entire first day of the experiments, not a single person was willing to enter the Kozarev Mir. That day, an otherworldly sense of dread and terror was felt not only by the research participants, but also Kuznichev and Trofimov, who described the sensation as very primal and animalistic. But unlike any natural emotional feeling, it seemed to have very physical effects. In the audio tapes, various volunteers described their experience with the fear. Quote, December 24th, 1990, Tape 1. Three of us came to the psychological distress room to work there. Having entered the room, we felt a kind of emotional pressure. We found a picture of three dots inside a circle. Somebody offered to put it into the Kozarev mirrors. Having done it, we felt a kind of emotional shock. We just couldn't keep standing around the mirrors. The fear was so strong, it seemed like a real thing you could touch. None of us have ever had such a feeling before. Tape 4 I was afraid to come up to the mirrors. My colleague decided to put a reproduction of the Banner of Peace by Nicholas Rourke into the mirrors. Once he stretched out his hand, he had fear. I felt my chest trembling. It was like coming into cold water. The fear grew so strong that I was close to running away. Next time we came to the room, I suddenly felt a strong blow to my head. Tape 5 we thought the source of the pressure was Kozarev's mirrors because as we got closer to them, the thrill grew. I felt cold and dizzy, like there was too much oxygen. My hands were trembling and my head grew heavy. While coming away from the mirror, the feelings went down. Once we were back, we felt the fear grow up again. At 11pm, the fear area reached outside of Kozarev's space. 
Even the air of the room seemed different. It was like after a thunderstorm. At 11.50 p.m., we decided to put a test paper into the mirrors. The test paper was of a round form with three circles and the Banner of Peace by Nicholas Rourke inside. I put it in between the mirrors. My hands trembled. I saw a black cloud in the center of Kozarev's space. It filled up the whole space of the mirrors. About 1 a.m., we felt the presence of some substance in the room. It felt like the substance came from Kozarev's space and filled up the whole room. The fear was so strong. We put a cross on the outside of the mirrors and it calmed us down a bit. But about 2 a.m., the fear reached its extreme. We went out of the room, but my colleague decided to go back for the cigarettes. As we passed the hole in the mirrors, we saw a violet flash shaped like a tree with branches and roots. At that very moment, my colleague got scared. We ran away from the room. I felt like something had struck my back. It was like a black cloud generating fear. Getting away from the room, I felt like there was a black cloud dragging behind me from the mirrors. In the morning, I had a headache. End quote. According to the records of Drs. Kuznetsov and Trofimov, the two researchers witnessed the violet flash that occurred at 2 a.m. when the volunteer went back for his cigarettes and noted that it was accompanied by the smell of ozone. Even more disturbing, though, was that the guards outside reported a hovering, glowing disk manifesting above the research facility itself at the very same time. Dr. Trofimov gave this statement, quote, the tester brought the symbol of Nicholas Rourke's Banner of Peace into the mirrors, and the tester was thrown back by a certain force field. Suddenly, inside the installation, there was a flash of a plasmoid. It was scary. We were not ready for this. We did not even have instruments to measure everything. According to the security officers outside, minute by minute, a luminous object in the form of a disk began to appear above our building. This happened around seven times, end quote. During the first two months of the experiments, there were exactly seven UFO incidents, and we'll return back to the UFO mystery very soon. But after these two simultaneous events at 2 a.m. on Christmas Day, strangely enough, Cousin Chief and Trofimov said that the bizarre sense of dread completely cleared from the testing area. So, on December 25th, they finally began the Kozarev Mir experiments. Sitting inside the aluminum spiral chamber, the participant would focus their mind as the researchers spun the device one and a half turns clockwise, and then the magic would begin. Within the Kozarev Mir, an intense spectacle was witnessed by almost every single participant. As Dr. Trofimov described, quote, Everyone who entered the mirrors of Kozarev saw a huge stream of symbols, signs glowing like neon signs. All of us saw it, admired them. These were real visible signs." End quote. In their published findings, Dr. Kuznetsov and Dr. Trofimov provided sketches of these symbols, which the research participants drew while inside the Kozarev mirror. The experiments in Deakson went on for six months, and these drawings here are from May 1991. Every row is from a different volunteer at a different testing time, all isolated from communicating with one another. Yet, people were seeing these same things. Cool. This is not a subjective feeling of the people seeing these characters. One by one, research participants who had not talked amongst themselves entered the mirrors. Each of them drew the symbols, the same symbols." End quote. I'd like to give context to two of these symbols. The first here appears to be the Eye of Providence, or the All-Seeing Eye of God, which is a very ancient symbol. It's mostly known for having been used by the early Christians who likely took it from the ancient Egyptians. And much later, the Eye of Providence became closely associated with the secret fraternal organization known as the Freemasons. The second one I wanted to mention is the circle with the three dots. This one is particularly interesting, as it's the symbol that the scholar and mystic Nicholas Rourke chose to use for his Banner of Peace. As we know, on the first day, a participant placed a copy of the Banner of Peace inside the Kozarev mirror in hopes of stopping the sensation of dread. However, the banner seemed to make things worse. According to the participant, it caused some black cloud to form inside the mirror, 
and spread out into the room almost like a physical substance. Just like the Eye of Providence, the symbol itself is a great mystery. Nicholas Rourke explained that he chose it because it was used to symbolize the Trinity in early Orthodox Christianity. However, when Rourke later explored remote parts of Asia, he saw the symbol also being used there. Thus, the symbol must be far more ancient than Christianity. It's best to get to the bottom of this now before we get on to the much crazier stuff to come, so let's temporarily time warp forward to 1997, a little less than seven years after the events at Deakson. By 1997, Kuznetsov and Trofimov had achieved such interesting results that they captured the attention of the international academic community, and that year, they organized a joint experiment with British scientists, setting up a Kozarev mirror and a monitoring station at Britain's famous prehistoric megalithic site, Stonehenge, located in Wiltshire, England. For whatever reason, working with the British must have flipped a switch in their brains, because it was at that point that Kuznetsov and Trofimov decided that the mystery of the symbols had gone on long enough, and experts needed to be brought in. In the years stretching between 1990 and 1997, they documented approximately 1,200 unique symbols, with a striking number of them reoccurring between different participants across different times and locations. The two researchers met with a team of linguists from the Siberian branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences and gave them their collection of sketches for analysis. Incredibly, the linguists were able to identify approximately 80% of the symbols, all extremely archaic and many of which could be traced back to megalithic sites and rock art of various ancient civilizations. However, one culture in particular dominated the group. As Dr. Trofimov explained, quote, at first, we thought the symbols were some kind of message to us. There are always many temptations and interpretations. Then we realized that most of the symbols we saw correlated with the Sumerian culture, symbols that have come down to us on clay tablets in cuneiform writing. It was a moment of history that broke into our zone. That is, somehow we entered that horizon of the information storage, on that shelf which refers to the Sumerian stage in the development of our civilization." End quote. Many of you might know that the Sumerian language is the oldest written language that we know of, dating back to as early as 3100 BC. But don't get the idea that the Sumerians are involved here though, because a better question to ask is who the ancient Sumerians might have been in contact with. Back in Deakson Village, 1991, the glowing symbols weren't the only reoccurring phenomenon experienced by those who entered the Kozarev mirrors. In the first week, almost every test was interrupted at some point by subjects reporting serious dizziness, nausea, migraines, paranoia, or dread. Over the following days, a handful of volunteers grew a tolerance to these symptoms and endured the discomfort, staying in the mirror for longer periods of time. The reports from various participants read as follows, quote, January 19th, 1991. Being inside Kozarov's space, at first I felt nothing at all. In a few minutes, I saw a human shape. It was white all over. In 30 seconds, it was gone. January 19th. Being inside Kozarov's space, I felt lifeless and laid down. As soon as I closed my eyes, I saw an object flying above. Then came the darkness, and then the light again. I was in a room I hadn't seen before. A man was standing in the center of the room. His face wasn't seen. He began to speak slowly. Your planet is in danger. It is suffering. I couldn't say a word while he was speaking. He said, there may be a disaster. I asked him, when? No answer came. January 21st. Inside Kozarov's space for five minutes, I saw myself at age five or something like that. His clothes were unusual, except the shoes which I still remember since I was a kid. Just before that, I was shivering with cold. January 21st. At first, in Kozarov's space, it was like waves coming on my head and my ears were tight. In some time, I could not feel my feet. After that, a tall man in a white suit turned slowly to me. Then I saw a series of images. There was a moment when I heard breathing down on the floor. 
my body trembled a bit, but realizing that I was alone in the room, I relaxed. January 23rd, I saw a flying saucer inside Kozarev's space. It was going down slowly. It was black with white windows. Then it suddenly went up and went away. January 23rd, being in Kozarev's space, at first I was scared by something huge coming at me from both sides. Then I saw that there were two armies approaching each other. Then it went away and I saw an erupting volcano. I saw streams of lava coming down and a huge cloud of sulfur over it. The whole time I kept my eyes open. As I closed my eyes, I wanted to sleep. But all of a sudden, I felt somebody touching my hand. My body shivered with fear. January 23rd. Being in Kozaro's space, at first I felt a kind of discomfort, which then turned into fear. I felt I had something cold right on my neck. I had a feeling of somebody watching me, so I was afraid to open my eyes. Then I felt my left hand fingers get pleasantly warm. It was like a dog licking them." End quote. The most frequent phenomena was documented by the researchers Kuznichev and Trofimov, and we can see from the table here that 75% of tests resulted in observations of UFOs, and 68% felt the presence of a so-called observer, and usually they describe this entity as humanoid, faceless and wearing white clothing, or simply a white silhouette of a man. It was obvious to everyone that Whatever it was, it wasn't human. Many test subjects said that not only did it feel like it was observing their every movement and thought, but that it had some enormous power over them, almost like complete mind control, though it didn't always exercise this power. Looking back at the table, we see that 40% and 30% respectively observed past episodes from their life, as well as detailed historical events long before they were born. This time warping seems to have occurred most frequently when the person was in the mirror for an extended period of time. As described by Dr. Trofimov, quote, When a person, on his own initiative, was in the mirror for several hours, he saw himself as a participant in the events that took place in the Roman Empire. He described the course of events in which he participated. End quote. The two researchers had no way of explaining exactly how this was happening whether these scenes are being broadcast to the subject like a virtual reality headset, or whether the subject is literally transported across space and time, or whether they're simply hallucinating. That said, those who saw familiar and unfamiliar places, people, and events couldn't shake the feeling that what they experienced was reality. Even if it didn't make sense in the present time, they felt that they traveled through time, that the Kozarev mirror was nothing short of a true-to-life time machine. But the scary thing was, of course, that the device was much more than just a time machine. It seemed to put participants in direct contact with non-human entities. Now it's time for us to talk about the UFOs. As Dr. Trofimov mentioned, there were seven unique incidents, some with multiple witness reports of serious UFO activity going on above Deakson. The first sightings began as soon as the Kozarev mirrors were set up in the research facility, around December 20th, 1990. These are a few of the records released. Quote, December 20th, 1990, 4.30pm. A UFO was seen above Deakson Village. The object looked like a car light with the beam directed opposite of the movement. It was going to the northeast, high up at low speed. Then it changed to the east and was gone. December 21st, 5.10 p.m. A UFO was seen going slowly north. It had four lights shining ahead the way it was going. Later, the UFO changed its course westward and then southward. December 25th, 2 a.m. I saw a red glimmering circle above the building. It was there for a minute and then gone. December 26th, 6.10 p.m. During the experiments in Kozarev's space, a few people could see a shining object flying slowly northwards. Beams were going out of it, and its light was still seen for some time after the UFO had flown away. Later, the object changed its course and faded away." End quote. 
There are more UFO sightings for us to get into, but on December 27th, something different was observed by the locals of Deakson Village, totally unknown to the researchers at the time. It wasn't a UFO, but an atmospheric phenomenon. As we know, Deakson is one of the world's northernmost settlements. Because of its proximity to the North Pole, it's a place where one can see the famous Aurora Borealis, also known as the Northern Lights. But this was definitely not a normal case of the colorful dancing waves in the sky. At 12.10 in the afternoon, and lasting over an hour, more than a hundred Deakson villagers marveled at what they described as thousands of multicolored shining arrows descending from the atmosphere, appearing to very slowly gather around the research facility. During this time, Dr. Kuznachev and Dr. Trofimov were running an experiment with a Deakson resident, whose name they give as V. Karolov. Because Karolov was a professional painter, the researchers recruited him to paint the images and scenes he saw while inside the mirror. During this experiment, the researchers noticed that their recording instruments began to malfunction and fail. However, they didn't want to bother the artist, so they left them undisturbed for another hour after which Karolov came out and the issues abruptly stopped. Later that day, the researchers and participants realized that small steel objects in the facility had become magnetized. They called Deakson's geophysical monitoring station and were informed that there had been a severe disturbance in Earth's magnetic field. Quote, a sharp decrease of the vertical component and an increase of the amplitude of the horizontal component of the magnetic field of the Earth from 160 to 990 NTL." End quote. I looked up NTL, but unfortunately I wasn't able to find what it means as a unit of measurement. However, usually the Earth's magnetic field is measured in nanoteslas, or NT, so I'm guessing that's what it means, and usually these are in the tens of thousands. So first off, a jump from 160,000 to 990,000 nanoteslas in the magnetic field is an absolute anomaly. In fact, a normal reading of the North Pole's magnetic field is around 60,000, so the reading was pretty darn high to begin with. Second off, near the North Pole, the Earth's magnetic field is significantly stronger than it is near the equator, and that's actually why the Aurora Borealis happens there. A strength increase as serious as we're talking about would cause a significantly more intense display, and perhaps that's what the villagers witnessed. Still, none of this sounds very natural at all. During the incident, the artist V. Korolov sketched three pictures while inside the Kozarev mirror. One appears to be three black mountains, or possibly pyramids, surrounded by a radiant light. The second appears to be some black ball descending to the Earth. And the third shows two black objects resembling spacecrafts flying above the Earth. So this brings us back to the UFOs. Moving into January of 1991, there were three more incidents, after which the UFO sightings stopped entirely. Quote, January 7th, 1991, 8.40 a.m. A bright yellow triangular object was seen. It was changing its shape from triangular to semi-oval. The quantity of radiated light was changing too. January 7th, 8.40 a.m. I saw half of a bright yellow ball, southeast in the sky. I noticed the ball changing its color. It turned brighter from time to time. Sometimes half of the ball got reduced to a quarter. At times it got covered with smoke. January 7th, 8.40 a.m. I saw a shining object which turned from triangular to semi-disc. The lower segment of it was lit up brightly. It probably radiated a light. January 17th, 5.10 a.m. I saw a UFO flying from the north, and it looked like a star then. Flying from the north, it grew larger. Then it stopped and turned to the northwest, getting smaller while flying away. The object had the form of an ellipse, radiating red-white light. Somehow, the object turned into a figure of eight, radiating red-white-green lights in a moment. There were beams of light coming off of the object. While in the form of a ball, the object had one beam of light coming out. When it turned into the figure of eight, it had three of them. 
those beams were moving around as if searching for something. The UFO remained in sight for about four minutes. Then the light went off and it was gone. January 26. I witnessed the UFO above Deakson Village. It was a ball shining like welding with a beam of light stretched back off of it. The beam of light had two sections. It was in the sky for about one minute. Then it vanished for a while and appeared again on the other side, having no beam of light then. The ball proceeded to move for another while, then stopped and a cloud went spiraling around it. I could see it for another five seconds, then it was gone. End quote. After these sightings, not a single UFO incident would be recorded in the four remaining months of the experiments. The strange phenomena inside the Kozarev mirror, however, would not stop. The visions of past events, the sensation of being thrust into outer space, the appearance of the mysterious white observer, and the unshakable feeling that one's mind was being controlled. But as the experiment in Deakson wrapped up, a more problematic issue began to surface. The Kozar of Mir seemed to have a lasting effect on research participants. One conclusion asserted by Dr. Kuznichev and Dr. Trofimov was that after a person accessed a state of nonlinear time inside the mirror, their consciousness would remain enhanced afterward in ways not quite understood. One subject reported that she now saw auras around living things, for example. Other common symptoms included instances of precognition, telepathy, and sensations of one's mind being controlled. According to a testimony given by one of the participants, quote, Outside of Kozarev's mirrors, I discovered I had unusual abilities. I could answer questions without thinking. I could tell a guy the number of his examination card or the date of departure long before it occurred. I saw an accident the day before it happened. Starting in late May, I had problems. I was afraid to be on the balcony because of a strong urge to jump off. I often had frustrations. That lasted till July." End quote. Another participant, interviewed by the TV station Russia One, described it as if the Kozarov mirror had opened a new intuitive channel in her mind. She had entered the mirror a total of five times, and after the experiments, she began to realize that she had strong precognition of things that would soon happen to her, and in those situations, it felt as if an external entity was guiding her every decision. The questions kept piling up, as did the responsibility weighing on the scientists' shoulders. Kuznichev and Trofimov began to grow seriously concerned about the intense physical, psychological, and psychic effects the mirror forced upon those who entered it. Dr. Kuznichev in particular began to feel haunted with the idea of continuing the experiments. He theorized two possibilities. The first was that the after effects might be a reaction to a human coming into contact with concentrated time energy and the information it carries. Our minds and bodies might not be able to process this. However, what Kuznichev was most paranoid of was that they were opening the door to a parallel world that might not be friendly. Specifically, he speculated whether the frequent sightings of the white observer in combination with the UFO sightings inside and outside the mirrors might indicate the presence of intelligent entities. And in regard to that first day of inexplicable fear and the feelings of intense sickness, tiredness, and temporarily losing control of one's own mind, it seemed likely that these entities can affect humans. Either way, Kuznichev and Trofimov came to a sobering reality, that they were far from understanding the kind of power they were dealing with. With ever-increasing caution, they decided to continue running the experiments with the Kozarev mirror, and did so as a team for many years. However, all recent publications are linked to Dr. Trofimov. To this day, Alexander Trofimov continues to perform research into the Kozarev mirrors and speak about it in publications and academic conferences. The most recent I found was in 2018 at the Second International Conference on Natural Hazards and Disaster Management in Melbourne, Australia, where Trofimov spoke about using Kozarev mirrors to predict natural disasters. As for Dr. Kuznichev, it appears that after the year 2000, he gradually took a back seat, perhaps due to his nightmarish anxieties. 
In a public statement given by Kuznichev, he reiterated his feelings. Quote, We have not yet discovered the mystery of these mirrors. Working with them carries many threats. They are connected not only with immersion in the unknown, a huge danger lies in the remote influence on the minds of unsuspecting people." End quote. In the last two decades, Vlail Kuznichev has spent much of his time in the realm of international law. In particular, he continues to push major appeals to the United Nations to ban psychotronic weapons, or weapons powered by psychic energies, which might very well include time energy. Of course, his main fear is of weapons being developed that repurpose Kozarevmir technology. In an interview with Russia One, Dr. Kuznichev warned the world, quote, This is very serious. If science does not deal with Kozarev and the development of space instruments, not only mirrors, this is a huge threat if we go in that direction. The universe is surrounded by mystery, the great unattainable, and the secret of cosmic consciousness may be the most disturbing." End quote. What do you think actually happens in the Kozarev mirror, and would you be brave enough to go into one? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this investigation and haven't seen my video on Nikola Tesla, I dive deep into the strangest esoteric mysteries and conspiracies surrounding the genius inventor, so definitely go check it out. Or if you want one of the most mind-blowing and convincing cases of the existence of psychic phenomena, I highly recommend you watch my two-part series on the CIA's top secret Stargate project. Thank you to my patrons, I really appreciate your support because it allows me to do what I love to do, and thinking about you guys keeps me grounded, especially in these rabbit holes involving time and space, and those you can really get lost in. If you'd like to join in, I've got links in the description to pledge monthly or make a one-time donation, and 100% goes back into these videos. Lastly, don't forget to show some love to Wonder. I use their app all the time, it's a ton of fun, and I definitely recommend it. I'm Mr. Mythos, never stop seeking. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.